think that's okay. <laughs> All right, so I think we are live. Um, the comment, can anyone hear us? Is it coming through all right? Um, if y'all can hear us, just you know, write something in chat. At least someone's watching. Uh, <laughs> so I got one hello, so at least one person is in right now. Um, yes, okay, so they can hear us. All right, so obviously, you know, my name is Brennan, and I am here with Mark Levinson um, from Milev's Reef. And we're going to be talking a little bit today about, well, starting off with what makes the saltwater hobby so daunting, you know, for beginners and kind of what is mm -hmm. keeping people out of getting into the hobby. Um, and then we'll kind of progress on from there and see what happens. Obviously, if people have, you know, questions shoot them down into the chat and I'll try to include them as I see them. So, yeah. So I guess, Mark, for people that might not know you, how long have like you been in the hobby? Like, what have you, what do you do? Um, just a little brief introduction of yourself, I guess. Yeah. I got in the hobby in 1997. So what is that? 25 years, something like that. 26 mm -hmm. years. And uh, I, as a kid, was snorkeling in the oceans and seeing corals and fish. And my dad had saltwater aquariums when I was a kid. And then, you know, I grew up and didn't have a tank. And then later on, I decided it's time to do something for myself. And I went into a fish store and I bought an aquarium and the rest is history. I've been doing this now for a very long time. And nice. I've learned a lot over the years and everything I learned, I would document on my website. And then that information was then used by other people to help them with their aquariums, which then led to me becoming a business where I sell aquarium supplies. And for the last, I don't know, six or seven years, I've been doing YouTube to educate people every Saturday on a live stream. Yeah, so I know a lot of people watch your videos and everything. And I mean, get a lot of, because you kind of do the same thing. You start out with a topic and, you know, go really in depth. Like I like the one you did about, um, like power cords and everything like that, you know, and little things that people mm -hmm. don't consider, you know, where it is a big deal. I mean, like you said in that one, you know, the guy pretty much burned his fish tank down just because it's easy to just push cables back there and, you know, forget about it. So, um, yeah, you know, I really like your channel for that. So when you started out, what, you know, was there that same stigma then of, you know, salt water is crazy, don't get into it, like just stick to fresh water? Or do you think that's a more recent thing? I think that it has always been known that it costs more than fresh water. And mm -hmm. there was this number that bounced around for the longest time that if you want to get in salt water, you, it would cost you $25 a gallon. And I kept saying, who came up with this number? Because it's not true. And so one day, probably in 2010, I crunched all the numbers and I said, okay, mm -hmm. if I want to set up a saltwater reef aquarium with proper gear, not the best on the planet, definitely not the garbage, you know, good gear I can trust. Just solid. I right. came out to $47 a gallon. Yeah, 47 bucks a gallon. So if you yeah. wanted a hundred gallon tank, you're looking at $4,700 investment before you get any livestock. And that's a lot of money, right. but it yeah. lets people at least have an idea going in what to expect when it comes to money. And there are ways to do things cheaper. And I always advocate that. I said, you know, you can buy things used from people leaving the hobby. You can look for sales like Black Friday. And mm -hmm. uh, you can kind of acquire things and you can get things uh, through, you know, marketplace or wherever, you know, you shop around for things to save some money. And, you know, you could save 50% on all the gear. You can buy a used tank for half the price and that gets you into the door. But the aquarium's the cheapest part. The glass box, yeah. that's your cheapest part of the entire project. Everything after that is where the dollars start racking up. Yeah, I mean, it's, well, like power heads, for example, are one of those things. I mean, like everyone's like, okay, MP40s, MP60s, you know, the AI Nero's like, and you go to buy one, you're like, okay, I'm going to need three or four for my tank. And one is, you know, four or five, six, seven hundred dollars. Wow. Um, 
And I think, so I actually made a video talking about how I don't, like one of the things I mentioned is I don't like a lot of the videos that are on YouTube because they say, you know, start up this tank for $300. And included mm -hmm. in that, they get a cheap tank and it's usually like a 40, you know, breeder or something like that, which is yeah. fine. Right. You know, they have their sand, they have the rock, they get a couple fish, whatever. But the thing they're not counting in that, and they all like mm -hmm. leave out is the $80 bucket of salt, you know, all the Hannah test kits that yeah. they already had because they have, yeah. you know, 15 other tanks, like all the other stuff that they already had, You're right. which costs a lot of money, they leave it off. And so it's like, that's, yeah. you know, you want people to know what they're getting into because I mean, luckily I did a lot of research before starting this tank, but like, if not, like yeah. you said, all of a sudden you, you're like, wait, am I really spending $50 a gallon? Like, that's a lot of money. Yeah. Um, All right, so let's so, let's do some math. You just said 300 for a 40-gallon tank. And so I did the math. That comes out to $7.50 a gallon. Mm -hmm. Sounds cheap. But like you said, it right. doesn't include all the accessories and the test kits and the salt mixes and the bucket to mix the salt and the mm -hmm. power head to mix the salt, unless you're going to put your arm in a bucket and do this for five minutes. Right. I mean, do these are things that are going to cost yeah. money. And that is the numbers I added up in my $47 a gallon. Right. It was everything, tank, stand, sump, skimmer, power heads, lights, uh, test kits, uh, refractometer to measure your salinity. Mm -hmm. Uh, which you can use a hydrometer you can you know there's different things that are cheaper but again i was trying yeah. to use gear that i could use for a decade um i also included salt mix i probably included sand and rock but i did mm -hmm. not include i mean rock is and expensive. i included salt yeah but i didn't include the the actual well i mean oh and the rodi system to make the water so i mean all those things mm -hmm. were lumped into the price you know because they need to be counted and that way they're, again, they're not surprised. And so I right. have articles on my website that just kind of basically keep it super short and simple where you can just kind of read the general rules of salt water while you're drinking a cup of coffee. And by the time you're at the bottom right. of the cup, you've read the article. And I mean, it's not super mm -hmm. deep, but then I have crazy long articles with massive in-depth about chemistry. Or I have yeah. big write-ups about lighting and what matters and proper intensity and proper spectrum. And then I have articles about dipping corals because if you're going to have salt water you're probably going to want corals and i mean it's, you can you can keep a tank super simple initially listen mm -hmm. you can set up an aquarium like you said a 40 gallon put some sand put a couple of rocks add a few damsels a couple of clownfish mm -hmm. call it a day and you're probably going to get out right. for under a thousand bucks i mean mm -hmm. probably less maybe i don't know 500 mm -hmm. 600 700 somewhere in there i set up a 27 gallon a year ago that I bought brand new from the fish store. I walked in the store and said, what can I have tomorrow? I was trying to be an impatient customer. And yeah. he said, I can get you this one. And I said, okay, tank stand. Yes, he goes, right. I said, does it come with a lid? He goes, I'll have to check. Then he got back to me and said, the lid's like another 80 bucks. I'm like, forget the lid. I don't want the lid. And uh, cause I work with acrylic and I can make a lid. Right. Um, and then I contacted the company in Florida and said, I need rock and I need it tomorrow. What can you ship me today? before you close. And he sent me a picture of some rocks and that, cause I wanted something called live rock. Live rock is mm -hmm. rock that's literally pulled from the ocean, covered in all kinds of organisms. And I love to start a tank with that rather than dry rock, which maybe in freshwater is the norm. I don't know. Um, to be honest, and so I, I would know. put in my live rock and I get sponges and I'd get tunicates and I get feather dusters and I get worms mm -hmm. and I get little macro algaes, plants. And I put all the stuff in the tank and I started the cycle. And then you have to wait for three weeks for it to cycle before you can put in your first yeah. fish. And I don't think you have to wait so long with freshwater. I don't know. I've never done freshwater in my life. I know nothing about it. It's been a while since I had a freshwater tank, to be honest, because I didn't have a tank while I was in school or anything like that. But I think it's about a week. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's about a week. And a no, lot of quick. people, yeah. the, the bacteria cycling, seem to have hit fresh water faster than it hit salt water. Mm -hmm. um, so like the new where people yeah. are dumping like Turbo Start or Dr. Tim's, whatever, you know, that's been around for fresh water a long time. Um, yeah. And like, so when I did this tank, I 
kind of hybridized the two methods. Like I added ammonia mm -hmm. and I added the, um, added turbo start, um, was the one I liked. Yeah. So I, added that because I didn't want to just wait. Right. I didn't want to just wait forever for right. it to eventually come out of the air. I was like, whatever, yeah. I'll cheat. I'll get it halfway there and go. Um, but unlike yeah. you, I didn't use live rocks. So everything mm -hmm. I was, I mean, the live sand is honestly kind of a joke. Um, from what I've no, seen no, and it's heard, real. like from biome it, checks. People, like, that's another fallacy. No, it's, it's not a, it's not fake. I know people like, oh, there's no way that's alive. There's no way that that can survive. And I'll, I'll talk no, about I why, just... because the bag, is, the bag is sealed and it was in a warehouse mm -hmm. and then it's sealed on a shelf. You would think, how can anything be alive yeah. in this? It's just wet sand. I'm being ripped off. And that's not what it is. It's full of bacteria that is hibernate, uh, hibernating. And once mm -hmm. oxygen mix in, it wakes it up. And I can compare that to growing brine shrimp. Have you ever grown brine shrimp and you just have a bunch of dry eggs in a package? Yeah. Or I bought oh, yeah. them in a coffee can. I had to cut open the can. I'm like, this stuff's alive? And I put it in some, yeah. you know, low salinity salt water and it turned into sea monkeys. And I had right. brine shrimp. And well, I mean, that's, that's an example of something that's completely kids, sealed and had no right. air. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Same thing with live sand. And whenever you put live sand in a brand new aquarium, within a couple of days, you'll have these little snowflakes all over the glass. Those mm -hmm. are a type of hydroid. They're like a jellyfish that don't swim. They stick to the glass. And if you take your cleaning okay. magnet, you just clean the glass, they all come off, and then within a minute, they're all back. And then a week later, they're gone. But that was part of what came out of the live sand. Hmm. Interesting. I didn't actually see those when I, because it was live sand that went into there. It was the Carob Sea um, live sand that yeah. went into this tank. I didn't notice those. Then again, maybe I yeah. just wasn't looking specifically for them. Obviously. They're, they're really small, small. So, and they're really yeah. pretty if you zoom in. <laughs> Microscope yeah. and everything and check them out. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah. hmm. Um, what got, um, okay. So someone asked what product um, recommended to cycle. What do you use if you were going to cycle a tank? Or do you just add ammonia and wait? What I did with my previous tank, which was my frag tank, I took a piece of raw shrimp from the supermarket. I just walked up to the deli and said, give me one shrimp. And mm -hmm. the guy is like, one? And I'm like, yeah, it's like a dollar. And he gives you the whole shrimp with the head, the tail, the whole beast. I just took that thing and threw it in the tank and let it rot for three days. And then by then it's goo. And you just take that thing out and throw it away. And the cycle has started. Now on the tank I did last year, I put in the live rock. And that rock was shipped. And because of it, there was some die off, I definitely had a cycle. And I did a, I documented oh, that process yeah. of setting up that tank. And I showed the test kit every single day. And you could see the ammonia go up, 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 and then come down. And then you saw mm -hmm. the nitrite, and then you saw the nitrate. Yeah. And it was a 21-day cycle. So I cycled it with a live rock. But there are other methods, like if people are using dry sand and dry rock, you could do the Dr. Tim's. You can use the Turbo Start. Um, and uh, I think there's another product, too, from Fritz that you can use that will uh, get things going. But the one thing I, I was Turbo surprised Star, to but learn, I think Brightwell I think, has one. Yes. I think that Fritz's Turbo Start has a, uh, I'm not positive about this. I might have it wrong. But it seems like if you pour that in the tank, then within 24 hours, you have to add a fish. Because if you pour it in the tank and there's nothing there, the bacteria you pour it in will just die because there's no food. So it's like mm -hmm. you have to follow the instructions on the bottle. And I'm pretty sure you have to have some fish involved immediately. So it's not really, well, it's definitely faster. And then Brightwell, like you said, Brightwell has a kit that's called the dry rock starter kit. And mm -hmm. you start with dry sand, dry rock, and you have three bottles in a box and one is ammonia. And then there's probably something like uh, Microbacter fuel or something like that. And then there's Microbacter seven. And that one's supposed to be an eight day cycle as far as I recall. So that one's pretty quick. And you didn't involve any animals. You didn't have to sacrifice a fish. You didn't have to kill a shrimp. Yeah. Um, yeah, I didn't use that one. I think of course I used, the shrimp I bought was again, dead. I, I didn't kill it. Start. Yeah, <laughs> I mean it was already whether or not you ate it or put it in the. It tank, was at the deli on ice. Right. <laughs> yes. um, right. That's the actually the ammonia source I used for this because I well work at a hotel so I just grabbed mm -hmm. one out of the kitchen and threw it in the tank. Um, you, you know, same sort of concept, yeah. but uh, so. What do you think 
So, I mean, we touched on that it's expensive. Do you think Mm -hmm. the hobby will ever, like, you know, because there are a lot of people that have really expensive hobbies. I mean, people have work Mm -hmm. on cars. People, like, people like expensive hobbies, and they're very popular. I would say you hear about them more than you do, like, saltwater fish. Like, is there anything else you think that's kind of holding this back from being as mainstream as say cars yeah Yeah. i think that um okay so let's just boil this down number one you've got people out there that say right out of the gate it's too hard they've just been told to say that they just regurgitate it so they've heard it from 10 people like oh it's too hard i'm never gonna do that it's too hard i've heard it's too hard it's too hard it's too hard it's too hard and you hear that and so you're thinking oh it must be too hard but it's not and so i always tell everyone Learn everything you can before you spend a dollar. And listen, before I ever went scuba diving, I I literally was reading all I could read about it. I was reading books about people dying underwater, and I just could not get enough of it. I just kept reading all these horror stories. You know, it was this fantastic book called Shadow Divers, and they were diving off the coast of New Jersey because they found a submarine that had made it all the way to the United States during World War II and sank down there. They didn't know who it belonged to. So they had to get into the sub, but it was so deep that people kept going down there to die. And I know, I'm laughing because it's just because of my reaction to it. Yeah. I mean, it was, but it was a well-written well, book. Well, I like okay? your reaction yeah, is explaining I'm how watch we... all these horror stories and then decide to do it anyways. Right. Like, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And that's what I did. I wanted to know what to look out for. I wanted to know, I mean, there was also a, a, a community forum that was about scuba divers and people would say how they went out on a boat with a group. And then when they came back to the surface, the boat was gone. And they were just in the middle of the ocean and didn't even know which way was land. And it took them like 48 hours to finally get back to land. You know, it was like this crazy survivor story of surviving in an ocean for so long. And I was reading, I was like, oh, so I definitely want a little sonar thing on my vest. So that way I can activate it if I'm ever abandoned. You know, stuff like that. You're just like, you're reading because it's kind of fascinating. But uh, when it comes to saltwater, if you learn as much as you can before you spend any money, you're going to save so much money. But if you just say, ah, I just want a tank, and you run to the store and you buy it, and you're like, I don't want that clownfish, and I want that anemone, and I want that lionfish, and you put them all in the tank together, the lionfish eats the clownfish, the anemone eats the lionfish, and you're like, man, this hobby's too hard, and you quit. And yep. you spend, you know, 500 bucks or 1000 bucks, and you're like, forget it, it's too expensive, and I killed everything, and it, no, I don't want to do it. So I talk about education being so important. And there are specific things that you need to do on a weekly basis, including water testing. And I tell people, test your water every single week on my show. And I know a lot of people that don't listen to me. I just keep saying it anyway, hoping it'll sink in. If you owned a swimming pool and you want to jump in it, you'd want someone to test that water first before you got in, right? Oh, yeah. Because you could get sick. Well, we're, our fish are animals. It's like having a dog or a cat or a bird. You need to make sure that the water is safe so your fish don't get sick or die. And if you Mm. kind of look at them as pets rather than as disposables, I think that changes how you feel about this hobby. And the fact is, in the end, you are literally the thinker of God. You decide life or death. If you choose to work on the tank, they live. If you choose to ignore it, you killed them. That was you. Mm -hmm. Not, oh, it just didn't work out. It's you neglected it. Just like if I stopped feeding a puppy and finally just died. And I threw it in the trash can. People would be outraged. They'd freak out. Mm -hmm. But if you stop feeding your fish and then they die and you throw them in the trash can, no one says a word. Why? What's the difference? It's still your pet. So it's just, it's less visible. So I do think people could say the cost. Well, it's, you know. Um, Go ahead. Just because the reason I say that is just because in, so like I said, I did an interview with Humblefish and I ended up saying exactly the same thing that you just said of, somehow people are treating fish like disposable commodities but if you did the exact same behavior and i think i actually used a puppy and i was like if you know three quarters of puppies died in under a year people would be outraged you know what i mean like yeah every organization under the sun would be looking at every component and cracking down on everything and owning dogs would be banned and like but somehow fish, it's like, oh, yeah. whatever. So, yeah. Uh. There was a guy who used to be a huge collector of clams. Lived in this general area. I went to visit him. 
and he bought lots and lots of clams. He loved them. He loved all the colors, the shapes, the sizes. And he had, I don't know, 19 of them, 35 of them, just a lot of clams. Yeah. And I, I like them too, but I buy one. I mean, you know, you can go crazy and buy two or three, but to have 30 plus. So anyway, he would bring in more because he wanted more and more and more. And he brought in some from like Vietnam or somewhere and they had a disease and it killed like half his clams. Like the new clam just wiped out mm -hmm. a bunch of his other clams and they all died and he just kept buying more. And he, uh, he had a roommate and, I, and they came to visit me and they were looking at my reef and they're like, man, your tank's so pretty. And I like, thank you. And then they mentioned how they lost all these clams. And I just said, you know, if those were puppies, you'd be arrested. <laughs> And he was just like, he just looked at me and I just said, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. And his roommate basically just made it just mouth, thank you. And because it's like, these are living animals. Right. And if you, I mean, okay, you're watching Survivor. This was a long time ago. I feel like it was a decade ago. And there was this one place, I think Vanuatu or something like where they were, and they got mm -hmm. a huge clam out of the ocean and they ate it for meat because they were starving. Yeah. And I was like, Ugh. You know, I kind of felt sad. I mean, it's probably a hundred year old clam. Then again, what does a hundred year old clam taste like? It's old, right? But anyway, I was just like, uh, they're eating it. All right. But apparently PETA and all them got super upset. How dare you kill this animal for your reality show? And, you know, of course, Survivor had to say, we didn't know that was going to happen. We were just filming. It just kind of happened too fast. We couldn't stop them. Once it was on shore, we just let it go, you know, whatever. It was kind of a public PR nightmare, you know? And, uh, I mean, but in the end, I'm not sure I buy that reaction because like, okay, we have no problem that they went out. So like I watched a video recently and a guy went out in Hawaii mm -hmm. and he went spear fishing and you see him at the end of he's bringing fish up and he brings up, you know, an Achilles tang, probably yep. this long, like massive, beautiful yeah. Achilles tang. And I'm thinking in my right. head, it's like for a fish <laughs> that big. I would have to pay mm -hmm. like a thousand dollars, you know, for that large yeah. of an Achilles tang at least. Um, yeah. And he just went out and like shot it with a spear. But like, I get a, <laughs> I always get a kick out of like those reactions where like, you know, they got upset because of the clam. They had no problem with all the other right. stuff they were pulling out of the ocean. Like, no, I agree. That's what I was saying. One clam re created this huge stir. Now, if you knew about yeah. some guy in Plano that killed 19 grams overnight, might be knocking mm -hmm. on their door, say what's going on in this house, you know, kind of a thing. Yeah. So anyway, he stopped buying them like that. He started to appreciate them as they're not infinite. There isn't just an, mm -hmm. a, an overabundance of clams in the ocean, doesn't matter how many we take. Just like fish, there's a limited amount of everything. And I try to think of each animal I get, each coral I get, I try to really be in the mindset this is going to live with me for a super long time if I do a good job. And if I mm -hmm. kill it, it's, I try to pretend mentally. I, I used to, at least in the past, I'm a little bit less strict about this. But I used to pretend in my mind, this is the last one on the planet and I'm responsible for it. <laughs> you know, it's like, I have yeah, to keep no, this coral fair. alive because it's the last one, you know, and it's this the is last gone, that's one, the end I mean, of the species. Well, and on, I mean, for some people, that's which is very dire, not necessarily yeah. would, with what you have, but for some people, that's not far off. I mean, if you look at like the yeah. project they're working on down in Florida and everything like that, some yeah. of those corals, yes, they're split up between a couple, you know, systems across the country and everything, but yeah, they probably are the last, you know, strand of yeah. that, you know, coral that exists. So like you have to take it seriously and, um, what's one of the things yeah. that's taking me a long time setting up my tank is I'm medicating and, um, quarantining all the fish that go into it. Same thing. Mm -hmm. I'm quarantining all of the corals that go into it. And I live in a one bedroom apartment. So if I have 15 tanks, yeah. you know, set up quarantining everything at the same that's time to many. fill this tank, yeah. yeah, it, it's not going to fit and it's going to cause issues. Um, wife's not right. going to be very happy with it, but you know, she's right. okay with the one quarantine system. Uh, so it's a slow yeah, process. You can have the, the point one. is <laughs> right. And, yeah. but the process, you know, the point is that once I get them to the display tank, I want these, you know, clownfish live 25, 30 years 
in like dream conditions that right. I know it's a long time, but yeah. I want to try to get, you know, at least 15, 20. Um, yeah. So. I no, it's true. I think it's kind of, I mean, I've had a Nazo Tang, which is from Hawaii. Mm -hmm. I've had mm -hmm. it since 2004. So I've had it for 19 years. It had to be at least a right. year old before I got it. So technically it's at least 20, maybe 21 years old. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, and clownfish can You're live talking 25 about years Spock, or more. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I named her Spock because like she has milk and eyebrows. Oh, got it. Okay. Um, cause I know that one yeah. you would, um, you had done an episode where you talked about like, I mean, you called the, the vet out for it and everything. Cause she wasn't doing well. So like, yeah, I mean, it's a yeah. pet. You've had 20 years almost like you take care of your stuff. Yeah. Like, but <clears throat> Yeah, it was neat having yeah. the fish vet come out. That was an interesting experience. And the yeah. best part is we caught the fish in mere minutes. I mean, I put the trap in there, and I'd say within four minutes we had it caught. And people are like, I can't catch these fish in my tank. I'm like, it's not mm -hmm. that hard. I've, whenever I had to catch a fish, it wasn't that hard. I don't like doing it, but if I have to do it, it isn't going to take me days to do it. I can usually catch that fish I need within a matter of, yeah. well, like I said, six minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Especially if they're not, I mean, if it's a little fish that spends 95% of its time, like, in the rocks, that's one thing. But, you know, yeah. people say they yeah. struggle with, like, the big tangs and stuff like that. It's like, just right. trap it and call it a day. Like, they're not yeah. geniuses. In well, there's general, so many so. different things you can do to catch a fish. If you have mm -hmm. to catch a fish out of an aquarium or out of an overflow box, which is the drain in the back, um, there's a couple techniques, but mainly, like, if you cannot just simply catch it with a fish trap, you can lower the water level in the tank so shallow yeah. that the fish is kind of on top of the sand, and you can scoop it out. But um, if it's in an overflow box, I've done this before. I had a small fish in there, and I took some one-inch tubing, and I stuck it in the overflow box, and I started to siphon. And I had about, I think I had about 30 seconds before the bucket was going to overflow on the floor. And I tried to siphon yep. out that fish, and I slurped it out just in time. I was like, okay, mm -hmm. I did that in three gallons. Yep. That's a win. So there's mm -hmm. different ways to catch fish depending on what they are. And sometimes you may not catch it for a while, but they're not impossible to catch. It's just, you know, being smarter yeah. than the fish. Now, you are lucky because with my luck, the day I struggled would be the day I was paying the vet to show up and look at the fish. Like that would be the day it would be hiding. Yeah. Um, so as far as yeah. you know, I'm concerned, you got lucky in that one. But yeah, she asked me in advance, can you trap in advance? I was like, no, I can't. Where am I going to put it? She goes, can't you leave it in the trap? Yeah. I'm like, you want to leave a fish this big in a trap for overnight or a day? I mean, how much oxygen's in there? I mean, it's a sealed yeah. box with a door. I mean, what must I do? Magically slide an air stone in there? I mean, no, I can't do that. And she's like, okay. So I she mean, was putting out all her gear. I put the trap on the tank. Like I a, did the fishing line yeah. and I stood back and I went, boop, and I caught it. <laughs> yeah. Like was, if, I mean, I, mean, I guess you, if you I transitioned it. it to like a acclimation box or something, but would be the only thing yeah. I could think of. Um, My concern was yeah. transferring it out makes her sticker, you know, just another stress level. Just extra I'd stress. Read, I wanted yeah. the fish to be as healthy as possible. Yeah, exactly. And so if you watch closely in the, in the video footage, as I'm backing up, I actually knock the tripod over and the camera comes back up. <laughs> Because I'm backing up with the fishing line in my hand, mm -hmm. and I walked into the cameras behind me, and I bumped it, and I kind of stood it up, get backing up, and then Spock swam yeah. in. I went Bloop, and I closed the door. I mean, it was it was like that. Yeah. It was so quick. So, All in the course of but a few yes, minutes. There are times where you could yeah. do things in advance, and if you had a hospital tank set up, you could do that. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that's one of those things I think a lot of people also don't consider is because you have to have. Like, I know you and I have different systems for, because you, know, you use safety stop, right? So you don't mm -hmm. quarantine them for, you know, a whole month and this and the other, but you have a system. Don't. I'm terrible. Yeah, I but do. it doesn't, as long as you have a system and you commit to it is one thing. Like, the only yeah. thing that I find stupid is the people that still just dump them in the tank with nothing and go, it'll be okay. And it's kind of like, and then you kill 19 yeah. clams and, you know, so it's not that hard. Like, okay, you don't want to have a quarantine tank set up, use safety stop. I mean, it's worked for you. Yeah. You have a tank, the tank's been set up, what, nine years, seven? 
how long has that tank been set up? Yeah, this one's been running for nine years. And Spock's yeah. been, you know, with me two tanks before that. Right. So, you know, you're talking... A, like, and all the fish I buy go through safety stop. Mm -hmm. Which, I mean, is it's what? Formalin and methylene blue, right? Methylene blue. Yeah. Yeah. And it's cheap. So five dollars is a package, right. and you can basically give your fish a two-part bath, including acclimation time, and two hours flat. That's not that long. Mm -hmm. I know some people right. that will do a drip acclimation for that long without the medicine, and all you have to do is acclimate yeah. for like twenty minutes or so, and then put it in the first part, which is formalin, forty-five minutes, and then move it into methylene blue for forty-five minutes, and then it's ready. And at that point, I put it into a, an acrylic box I call the Peacemaker that hangs in the mm -hmm. aquarium it's got holes all over it and the fish lives in there for three days where the other fish can see it but they can't fight with right. it because the new fish that goes into the tank is stressed and it releases a stress hormone and it tells all the other fish attack it's the craziest thing ever so if you can leave it in this box even though with a hormone in the water the fish don't know to attack and this guy's safe and then after three days that hormones dissipated everything's fine they've seen each other for days i just pour it into the reef and I have no aggression problems. Now I don't buy right. aggressive fish in the first place. I'm not mm -hmm. I'm not a predator tank. I'm a reef safe friendly tank. Yeah. But I, I do pick fish that could potentially argue with each other. And I mean, you uh, have you'll see the case of squabbling in the tank where they chase each other. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So So there is I mean, that some people but have the peacemakers issues, work but... really well. Yeah. Yeah. What would um Oh, I was just about to comment on that. So Another thing that I see a lot, and I think it confuses a lot of beginners, to be completely honest, is that the the rating for, you know, corals and fish and everything, you know, it's, it's beginner, intermediate, and expert. And yeah, I, I think it's misleading I, because, in my opinion, expert only doesn't really mean you have to have been in the hobby for, you know, since 1997. What it means is it's a lot more work like that. It's more intensive usually, um, you know, like Achilles mm -hmm. tanks are expert only because they're a lot more sensitive to disease. Um, copper bands are expert only because they're hard to get eating. Like it's the yeah. amount of energy that has to be involved. And I think it, you know, because people like if you look online, everything just says expert only with no clarification as to what that means. Um, like, why? Yeah, I could see that. Mm. Yeah, I could see that. Um, I tell people like if they want to get an anemone that uh, they should or or well, yeah, that one or a mandarin. I say you should wait mm -hmm. nine months before you get it. And they're always like, why nine months? And I say, because that'll give you nine months to become better at your hobby you yeah. will become more in tune with your aquarium. Your aquarium is maturing and becoming more stable. All those dumb mistakes you make in the first few months, the mandarin or the anemone won't tolerate it very well. Mm -mm. But you know, other fish may, but certain things won't, okay? And so yeah. you will learn never to overdose this product or you'll learn not to skip a water change. You'll learn that testing matters. And finally, by about the ninth month, you have become more mature as a hobbyist. Mm -hmm. Now you're not an expert, but you have more right. knowledge now than you did day one or or day thirty. And to just say, you "Oh, at least it's pretty," know I want what it. It's a terrible of. way to shop. Yeah, yeah. You know, and a lot of times week people one, try it's to, easy to they, say, "I'll they, test every day." They overshoot. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, like week one, it's easy. It's to so say, yeah, easy I'll to say that's pretty. I'll make it good and right. Right. Or they'll say, I can do it. You know, and like, no, you really I'll, can't. I'll buy copa pods. I, I mean, my Al enemy video. Them into the system every day, like, you know, for the Mandarin. Like, I'll make sure right. it has, a, they get expensive. Like, you probably won't. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, sorry. I mean, look, I bought a fish from Live Aquaria last year. And I mm -hmm. bought a Mandarin, and it came in so starved. And I just looked at it, and I thought, that's not good. I put it through the safe to stop bath. I just put it in the reef. I didn't even do the peacemaker. Mandarins don't fight with other fish usually. And I just put it in there and said, good luck, buddy. Because it's 400 gallons of hopefully tons of copepods because there was no other pod eater in my tank. 
And I was mm-hmm. really hoping it would survive. And for the first three days, that fish didn't even move from, it just went straight down and sat next to a rock, didn't budge. And I was like, that's not good. Yeah. And it was like the third day I saw it scoot up one inch up the rock and kind of like take a taste of the rock. Like just kind of tit. I was like, all right, that's a good sign. And now that's a fat little fish. It's doing really yeah. good. <laughs> but I put it into a tank that was eight years old. It had been very right. established. There was no lack of food that it could go forage for if it went looking. Mm-hmm. But there is also the problem of buying fish that are healthy in the first place. And you could buy fish and do everything right and still they won't make it. That's another challenge of this hobby. It's not guaranteed when you buy something, it's going to live. Yeah. Um, well, and that's especially the risk with things online and it's become, okay. So they all have, and I think it goes back to what we were saying previously, you know, we treat it as disposable because, you know, as far as you and I are concerned, we buy a fish through live aquaria or wherever it's got, you know, so long of a return policy. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, I, when I bought corals recently, I got them from worldwide corals, 10 days, you know, so if anything died in shipping or over the next 10 days, I don't have to care. I get my money back. I get another coral. You still killed it. Like, you know, so I prefer to buy fish and stuff like that in store where I can physically see them that they're healthy and have best chance of survival a lot of times because you don't even get Look, I have that a fish long store. A window. i've got a fish store right by my house i mean literally i could walk to it it's that close okay it's quarter mile mm-hmm. and i went there and i bought three peppermint shrimp okay they put them in the bag i went to the register i paid for them and i came home and when i walked in the door one was already dead I was like, it died on the way home. I was just like, um, I know you don't do this whole guaranteed stuff, but it didn't survive it to my door in the one, you know, the two and minutes it neighbor, took to drive home. Like, There's just no way. Yeah. Yeah. And so he was like, yeah, we'll just give you another one. So I guess that little thing had a heart attack and died in the bag. I have no idea, but it was crazy that it died. So, you know, it was fine and it was dead just like mm-hmm. that. So I, I'll well, tell you another thing. I ordered uh, two fish yesterday for my reef from a company mm-hmm. in uh, Minnesota. And then I sent a message to the store manager and I said, listen, please don't ship it on Thursday for a Friday delivery because if anything goes wrong with UPS or FedEx or whoever you use, I won't get it till Monday. That's too long. The animal right. won't live over the weekend in a box. So then before this phone call, I got an email saying, here's your tracking number. And I was mm-hmm. like, no, because that means no, it's coming right. tomorrow. And I'm if working tomorrow, goes wrong. I'm working in Dallas, I won't even be here. So I called him up and said, did you actually drop that off or did you just print a label? And he says, we printed the label. I said, okay, I need you to not ship me that yet. I want you to ship it on Monday for our Tuesday arrival. Because if something goes wrong on Tuesday, I get it Wednesday. That's two days, right? right? Or if it goes wrong Friday, it's Monday. That's four days, you know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. So mm-hmm. I was just like, I don't want to do that. And they said, okay. I said, I'm sorry you already bagged it up and packed the box and all that. I said, but these are the lives of the animals, and I care more about that than rushing it out the door. So the guy said, nope, I understand. Especially because you no already so told him, like, put it back in the tank. You know, you had already told him. I did. Him, he I said, left a message, sure, and, and I guess then... the message didn't get told to the employee. Yeah. Yeah. But. Yep. I had. So, um, anyway, that's how important it is to me that things stay alive. Yeah. <laughs> I had sort of similar to that. I ordered. Um, urchins uh from Mm -hmm. algae barn and algae barn Mm -hmm. did nothing wrong the post office by my house did so i'm in massachusetts it's cold um this was probably back in november maybe but it was like they'll be fine Mm -hmm. you know next day shipping and usually usps does not drop packages at my house like I'm in an apartment complex. Mm-hmm. And so where the mailbox is, it's just the little like letter slots and they refuse to drive the package to your actual apartment. So they take it back to the post right. office and you can pick it up the next day. I was like, okay, that's yeah. fine. They're urchins. They're going to be sitting, you know, in a warm room overnight because I had done this once before you from think? the exact same company. <laughs> right. Well, I had done it yeah. once before from algae barn. So exact same system. Mm-hmm. 
Right. Our normal postal driver happened to be out of town, I guess. Mm-hmm. I guess we have like package lockers that were somewhere else mm-hmm. on the property. I didn't even know existed. Mm-hmm. And so, okay. You know, I saw the mail drive by at like 10 a.m. I had, was leaving for work. I didn't think anything of it because, like, it's just going to be the little piece mm-hmm. of paper. So I'll get it later and then I'll go get the right. urchins tomorrow. I come back, I think, from work, like eight hours later. Again, it's November in Massachusetts. And yeah. these urchins were sitting in that. It's like, oh, jeez. Somehow, though, and the water was like maybe 50 degrees. But somehow wow. they both came back and were fine. Like, mm-hmm. they looked like hell when I, um, but no, they both came yeah. back. But it was like, so. Uh, That's good. That was a good ending to the story. I thought it was going to go really bad. No, they actually lived. But it was just like, you've got it because anything can happen was kind of the point I was trying to get to. It. Just, yeah, you know. Yeah. Go figure, you know. you. I mean, over the years, I've done a lot of things. I've, over the years, I've done a lot of things. But listen, let's get back to your original part. Is it too hard? Is it mm-hmm. going to be impossible? Is it ever going to get easier? The knowledge part is always the hardest part with everyone. Getting people to learn stuff does not satisfy the craving of getting something. You know, you just want to have it. You, If you wanted to have a watch collection or a car collection or a, I don't know, some other hobby like that, yeah. you, know, you want to acquire these things, you want to show them off. And when it comes to aquariums, it's a slow build. And I think saltwater, because I don't know freshwater, so I can't compare, but I'm assuming that freshwater, you kind of set it up and you're done. It's just there. It's done. It's pretty. Saltwater, it's a building project. And it's an ongoing mm-hmm. thing, and it's constantly evolving. Mm-hmm. And it, the look changes, the feel changes, the livestock changes. And you you have this whole ecosystem going on where I just see a freshwater tank, like a planted tank, for example. It's pretty, but it's done. I mean, other than going in there and trimming it to maintain that look, it's done. Right. And with a reef, it, there's always more to go. There's more to look forward to. Mm-hmm. There's more opportunity. There's trading of corals between hobbyists. There's discovering new fish you never heard of. And you're like, oh, my God, I want that one too now. I mean, mm-hmm. I see stuff I want, but I can't buy it. For Either it's too expensive or it's too rare. I just can't get my hands on it. And so when I see someone else have it, I'm a little jealous. But at the same time, I'm like, they got there first. They had the money. They win. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. okay. Oh, yeah. You know, I just enjoy what I um, Yeah. So, I mean, like, I went down to a local fish store, and they had uh, – and I don't actually love these fish, but they had, like, one of the Yerpel tangs. But it was like you said, you know, it's like $7,500 fish. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to have it, but it was really cool to see. And, like, I could understand why, like, yeah, you want that immediate sac- satisfaction of just going in and buying it. And, you know, you throw it in a tank and, you know, have this. But – I do know, you know, to your point, freshwater, it's not quite instant. Like sometimes you have to let them grow in a little mm-hmm. bit, but whereas like mm-hmm. coral, especially like SPS and stuff is, you know, one to two years mm-hmm. to really be where you want. Freshwater is yeah. like one to two months to really be where you want. Um, Here, yeah, I'll can... throw some aquarium stuff on my side of the screen. Mm-hmm. Let me make that. This is um, it's a little dark. Give it a second. It'll get brighter. So this is some footage I shot last night. I was trying something out with my camera, so it's not great footage, but it kind of shows you some corals growing Mm -hmm. in a mature tank that's been running for nine years, and uh, that's a copper band butterfly with a yellow tang. Here's the entire Mm -hmm. reef itself. That's a 400 gallon aquarium that's seven feet long. Uh, let's see, let me jump ahead a little bit here so we get any more. Oh, see, there's nothing there. Let's jump over here. Sorry. Um, but these are all colonies that grew from like one inch frags, you know, just a little one inch stick glued to a rock. Give it some time and give it all the perfect parameters, and you end up with a beautiful reef tank. And all those colors, they right. look vivid and all, but they're 100% real. There's nothing fake mm-hmm. in there, there's no plastic. It, it's all being lit with LED lighting. And uh, what are you there's using pumps for in there for flow at all times. I'm using the Radeons, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, Neptune Skies, which are from Neptune oh, okay. Systems. And, How do you uh, like them? I've been I running them for almost those two in years. Person. I love them. I love them. They're awesome. And this is late at night when I'm feeding my tank, when the tank's really blue. When I, um, mm-hmm. 
during the daytime, the tank looks a lot more sunlight looking, more daylight looking, because that's the beauty of LEDs. You can adjust the spectrum and get a better looking, uh, you can change the look of the tank by flipping a couple of switches in an app. Right. Sorry, it's so jerky. I was not using a tripod at all. I was walking around the tank with a with a DSLR, <laughs> with an icon, and trying to freehand. No, I don't blame it you. doesn't come out quite as smooth as I'd like with an iPhone. But yeah, so this is kind of, you know, this is pinnacle stuff you're looking at when it comes to saltwater. Most yeah. people are not necessarily shooting for this. They may see it and think that's really neat, but that's not for me. But for me, this is exactly what it should be. <laughs> it should be beautiful so, corals and big, fat, thick, healthy fish. At what point, I mean, because we were talking about how long this takes. At what point did you get your tank to a point where you would say it was full and then you were spending more time, you know, trimming back as opposed to just letting it grow out as much as possible to fill up the tank? Like, how long did that take um, to fill out? On this tank right here, probably within a year and a half to two years, it was already kind of getting there. And around year three or four, it, it starts to look full. And okay. most people tend to, I mean, there's two different types of people in this hobby. There's the type where they like, I want to cut these corals up and I want to recoup my money. I want to just cut and mm -hmm. sell and cut and sell and let the hobby pay for itself, which I don't believe in at all. I am more about let it grow, let it grow, let it grow. I mean, just get it as big and as awesome as possible. And I keep my hands out of the tank as much as possible. And I love the look. And people say, man, your reef looks so natural. And that's just like a huge compliment to me. It doesn't look like a fruit stand with all the colors mm -hmm. and all the separations. Right. And it just, it just, my stuff co-mingles and looks all crazy and mm -hmm. gorgeous. Let me grab a picture and throw it on the screen for you. Give me a second to find it. I, um took this picture a couple days ago and it was just so neat and it's not something you normally see and it doesn't last long term. Where is that shot? I think it was right. Oh, I take too many pictures. Hang yeah. A second. Well, that's being me that's with like, the right. YouTube oh, and everything. There it is. I just saw it. Dang it. Finding footage on my phone is too much. Where did it go? I just saw it. As soon as I find it, I'm a, here it is. Look at this. Look at this ridiculous picture. This cor this right here yeah. is all the corals in my tank. I mean, it's crazy. And I mean it's yeah. they're all touching, which is not usually allowed. You know, right. you've got like seven different species of acropora. There's also some bird's nest mm -hmm. in there, which is not acropora. But they're all and there's yeah, an acropora so in the bottom left corner mixed, there, the one that's the bright, color yellow, mixing, green. like yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, like, and that's really cool, and, just, and that takes years is a to really do. Natural... You can't do that overnight. Right. No. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can't do that overnight. <laughs> plus, they you have can't to even put them in there like immediately other. if they're big. Right. Yeah, you can't take like a new you you can't put big corals next to each other like that and expect them to just get along. They can fight, and you they could one could kill the other. So there's that risk as well to keep in mind. So with that, would you say that corals? if they grow up next to each other over time, kind of develop almost a, I don't want to say resistance, but just like a, I guess they stop caring as much because they're just, you know, okay, he's over there, whatever, I'll do my thing, they'll do theirs, like, or did it does the warfare kind of continue? Yeah, some, some can be friends and others will duke it out and some will tolerate each other enough They'll kind of like burn a perimeter between the both. <laughs> and it was like that burn mm -hmm. mark between the two corals touching. And yet this one's alive and this one's alive. And it's just like this white line in the middle. that's just kind of like, we will not cross. Dead space, you know? yeah. And then sometimes you have one just kind of like, whoop, and goes right down the other side mm -hmm. and just keeps going and kind of smothers one away. It really comes down to what it is. But initially when you're planting corals in a tank, you give them plenty of space, like two, three inches apart. And mm -hmm. I also try to discourage people from buying a lot. It's really easy when you first start the tank and you've got all this empty rock and you go to the store and let's just say they had a fantastic sale and you can get all these mm -hmm. little fragments for five or $10 each. You're like, oh, I can get 20 or 30 pieces for like less than 200 bucks. Let me do that. And then you plant 20 or 30 pieces in your tank. Well, to me, being in the hobby so long, I would know that's not gonna work out and you're gonna end up with five dominant corals 
and the other 25 are going to be gone in a couple of years. There's nothing that's going to be alive. They'll either die of natural causes, they'll die of fighting, they'll die of a mistake you made. <laughs> but there's going to be like five things that are going to survive. And typically, they're not mm -hmm. the prettiest ones. It won't be the high dollar frag. It'll oh, always it's never be that the... one that costs you nothing. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's never the Walt Disney it's that you happen the, to get the on the one crazy that's deal. brown. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. It's the one that's been browned out for the last five years and it's just, you know, surviving in the corner. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, I oh, think you so also, gotta... did you ask me in your email? Mm -hmm. I thought you asked in the email what keeps you from getting bored. Did you ask me that too? Or was that? Oh, I think so. Maybe yeah. I'm wrong. So, what kind of. Um, I think so. Yeah. What is it that kind of keeps you engaged and doing all of the tasks, you know, because at this point you're not really buying new stuff all the time. You know, the thrill of just going out and right. buying new stuff is over. Now it's testing yeah. and water changes, you know, and stuff. So like what keeps you engaged after all this time in the i hobby. do like to see what's changing in the tank i like to look at the corals closely i love to take macro photography and really zoom in and then put it on my monitor and then blow it up as big as i can to really look at the coral um i'm not always looking to buy something like you said sometimes there's nowhere to put it i mean i just bought a little frag the other day i was like that thing looks really interesting and i just put the frag on top of a colony I was like, mm -hmm. right there, you are going to live there for the moment until I can find you a better spot. But see what for happens. the most part, keeping the, op the system operational and healthy and clean, those are my number one goals. And then once I've got the, you know, got that solved, then I try to look at what's required for the tank for the next six months. Like, does some piece of gear need to be updated or replaced or really cleaned well, like my calcium reactor or my protein skimmer? Mm -hmm. These are things you clean once a year. And so there's that, but that's not really super interesting to some people. For me, it's really the life in the tank and making it look as natural as possible. And so you don't see things in my tank like frag racks stuck to the front. Uh, so many yep. people do that. They put a, a plastic tray with a magnet right in the front of the glass or it's on the side because they want to put, there's a row of five or six corals. Mm -hmm. Well, all those corals belong on your rock work and they should be growing there. They don't belong on this weird looking thing. There's no frag racks in the ocean. And so I always try no. to compare, how can I make this look as much like a, a dive trip? And so and the other thing that, that will make any hobbyist happy is to get up on a step ladder or on a step stool or on a chair and look down at your tank from above. That look is completely different than what you see all day long. And so if you were to glance down from above, you know, stop the flow in the tank, you have this fantastic view that's so much more appealing. And that picture I showed you of all the corals was a view from above can't see that looking mm -hmm. from the front it's it's kind of invisible right so those are kind of the things that keep it interesting for me well that's one i like have you seen um uh what's his name chummingham's reef it's completely different yes. from how everyone else sets up and i know he's growing corals so like part of it is because it's practical he is but he says you know he loves that top down view and it really is because it's an angle that you don't see a lot you know, and he gets a lot of flack for it because he doesn't have, you know, the tall where you're looking through the set. But, I mean, it's a cool perspective, uh, you know, to be able to see down. And it really is. It's that's the where you get view. that mixing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you can see better a lot of colors because the light hidden. is over your shoulder looking down. Yeah. yeah. I think a lot of times, yeah. though, it's and sticking your head above the, the tanks and under the Yeah. Yeah. You have to stop yeah. the flow. I mean, right. I've got this crazy notion for a future aquarium in my house where if for some reason this thing finally just explodes and just lets go of all the water and I have to replace it. I'm going to get a new tank that's probably th three feet tall and it's going to be on a one foot stand. So it's going to be all the way down to the floor. So it'll be four feet tall, okay. right? Mm -hmm. Or whatever is the height to my waist. Maybe it's less than four. I'm not that tall. Okay. <laughs> but the goal is I can walk up to the tank and I can just bend over and work in the aquarium. And mm -hmm. I just like the idea of when I'm sitting in my sofa, I can look down on my reef. And then when I want to walk up to the tank and look down from above, I can hit a button and the lights will lift up out of the way. All the flow will stop in the tank and I get to enjoy the view, maybe feed some fish. And then 10 minutes later, it all just comes back to life and the lights are lower back into position and it just resumes. 
and that would be my next choice of a tank. And it's really weird because no one puts mm -hmm. a tank near the floor because you usually want all your equipment under it. And I would put all my equipment. And you want to be able to see it. I would have to rearrange right. my whole room. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But Honestly, I just love the idea of walking like up that, and seeing You wouldn't it. even need. You wouldn't even necessarily need to make it, you know, all glass like or acrylic or whatever. Like you could have, right. You know, solid sides that you couldn't see through, and because you you're not really going to you apply with you're tank. not going to kneel down yeah. most of the time. You know, a lot of people yeah. could do that. You know, they're not going to kneel down and look. Um, okay. Oh, you on, see, for me, I just, just like, no, yeah, it'd be terrible cleaning the glass if you had to, like you said, get on your knees to, because oh, yeah. it's mm -hmm. down low. But I just felt like sitting on my chair or my sofa, I would have this great view. You could look down on top of the corals seated. seated. Mm -hmm. I mean, that just seemed like a really saw, nice change of pace for me. I saw someone and they set up and they did it outside, actually. They must have been down south somewhere. But they set a, like, one of those outdoor patio tables, and they built mm -hmm. a reef into that, and, like, there was a glass top. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like what you're saying, where, you know, they were able to, nice. if you're outside, you know, in the patio, you're able to look down and see everything. And I was like, oh, that's cool. Yeah. So, like, <laughs> I think you'd have to be careful, because as you're putting stuff down, you're banging on it and messing with the fish. But, yep. you know, if you did it in such oh, a way that Oh, I can think of five things that you have to worry about. Yeah temperature filtration sunlight yeah. oh yeah I, mean, I can just think of all these things that could possibly go wrong but uh but there was like a guy in italy that did a really alleviate tank some. In the ground yeah uh uh julian sprung has his outside reef yeah he is the one yeah. right outside his house. Mangrove thing. but i mean he's right, also yeah. an insane professional so <laughs> he is. not going to try to duplicate he what he's doing um right but yeah he's got that mangrove um yeah reef with i don't know what he has for fish in it but i know he had a bunch of coral in it so yeah it's a shallow lagoon yeah i saw it recently mm -hmm. myself there was a guy in italy he put a tank in the middle of his backyard in the middle of the you just dug a hole and put the tank in the dirt i mean just he insulated it first and he put the tank in the dirt and the top of the tank was solid glass too and then on one end, he put, I always call everything a chimney. He put a chimney going up, okay? And then he poured the okay. water in the chimney to fill the entire glass box to the glass. So it came all the way up, so there's no air bubble at all. It's just pure, you know, basically it's in the ground. And even with the grass was the top piece of glass, okay? And on the chimney is where he'd put top off or he'd reach in to aquascape, you know, with like long tools. And so he could literally sit there with a the lawn chair, had his feet in front of him, and there's the aquarium, and he could watch the fish swimming around the circle of rocks. Kind of neat, right? And I was like, but how do you do the filtration? And he had dug a trench in the lawn that went to a little shed in the corner, and there was a sump, and there was a skimmer, there was a chiller. He had all this equipment in there, and it all pumped in. But like I said, he had to lift the lid off the chimney area to reach in to work in the tank and like, clean the glass so you could still that's the, the part that gets me like the thought of having to reach up under to do yeah. like yeah everything I, I do the maintenance on everything. mine and everything yeah. like that but i know that yeah. if i had to reach down like get it and like i would neglect yeah. it um like yeah yeah or like it was so I mean, neat okay, maybe you clean but it didn't glass, last long term a coral falls over yeah it's staying there yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't think he kept it a whole year. I think that this is a neat idea. Probably didn't work out. I really wanted to see it work longevity wise. I wanted to hear the, how he pulled mm -hmm. this off year after year, no matter the season. That would have been amazing. Yeah. You know, hot summer, cold winter, he'd knock in the snow off the glass to look at his reef, you know. <laughs> yeah. But I don't think it worked yeah. out. Yeah. Because we just never heard about it again. You know, it's like, oh, bummer. And usually they go silent. They never make a video saying, oh, it died or oh, I took it down. They just, disappear mm -hmm. um yeah. i had an idea which i was i haven't really been able to find a good reason why it wouldn't work but also no one has done it to my knowledge um mm -hmm. i think it would be really cool to build a reef upside down mm -hmm. um so to figure out a way to light it from the bottom 
mm-hmm. and then just have like everything growing down. I don't know. It just because it's different, and I kind of like different. Like, yeah, I was just, oh, that would be cool. And I couldn't find anyone that had done it, but at the same time, I couldn't find any reason why not to. Um, and so I don't know if I'll ever do it, but the idea just always struck me as really cool. Let me send you a link. I'll put it in your chat here. I abandoned my window. Sorry, I'm back. So here is your chat. Is there a way to comment in here? Maybe I can't comment. Um, Comments are from live. Oh, you viewers. can't add a guest comment. Chat. I'll just stick it in the guest chat. Uh, I'll put it right there. Yeah. Okay. So oh, reef builders. That right, right there me... is um an mm. upside down reef from Johnny Ciotti back in 2010. It's not completely upside down like you're describing, but he the way he arranged it, the rock works at the top and everything was underneath it. He had like fun corals and everything under it. It was really, really neat. But um the thing is that, there we go. <clears throat> yeah, see you got it on there. Look at that tank, that's crazy, right? But you're talking about lights yeah. from below, not lights from No, below. I right. And see I he put corals like, down there that didn't need light. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, see no, my thought is like you do the same. Can you see my mouse showing up? Is it? So yeah, you I do. Would do the same thing, but oh no, I don't. Instead of sand, <laughs> Sorry, you have no. um, okay. Uh, I don't know if I can. Well, either way. So where the sand is, you'd have just a bare bottom. Yep. And you're you right. know something almost like your Neptune skies. That's really you know large profile. Yeah. Would be yeah. you know <laughs> kind of just carpeting the bottom and light so it comes up yep. through the glass and i don't know if you'd get the par you need and everything for like sps yeah. and everything but maybe yeah um maybe i don't know i just think it'd be a fun do project it. to mess with um you yeah, should do it you should try it out sponsor that one i don't have to talk to you know someone to sponsor that one after i get you'll have to bigger. get really creative because you have <laughs> Yeah, you're gonna need to keep cleaning the bottom glass so the light can keep shining through it. Yeah, it's gonna have to be pristine. Grows, it's gonna cover so, it. um, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And with all the rock above, you gotta reach under to scrub it. Yeah, you know, it's gonna be a little hard. Mm-hmm. But wouldn't that be a cool I one? Think... Even if you could just pull it off, if you could pull it off for April Fool's Day, that'd be amazing. Can you do that like the next couple of days? <laughs> it, I don't think I'm that capable, um, and don't have that kind of budget. Uh, you know, if I was BRS yeah. or something, I might be able to, but you know, I, I don't have that kind of right. budget. Uh, no, that would be cool though. So maybe by next April Fools. Yeah. I'll just take my maybe. ten gallon. Then you, like, then you can say no, it's real. Out how to do it. Yeah. <laughs> you can say no, I'll it's take... real. Stop making fun of it. Mm-hmm. It's real. I'll take my like ten gallon um quarantine tank and just do it in that, just a little nano. Yeah. Um, right. No, oh, but so someone made a comment in the chat, and mm-hmm. uh, how do I? Okay, um, and he's talking about like as he moves, and I actually am also mm-hmm. moving, so it just prompted me to you know ask a question while I have an expert. What are your right. tips for moving? Like, I'm gonna have to break <laughs> things down, move because it's yeah. gonna be the same tank set up. I don't know, 30 minutes away, give or take. Um, okay. What size tank? Uh, 90 gallon. So not huge. It's a lot of work. But not it's small. Big. I mean, it's still big. 90 gallons is 900 right. pounds of water. But uh, mm-hmm. all right, let's just pretend we're not lifting water. You've got to, how old's the tank been? How long's the tank been running? Since October. So what is that? This tank's. Almost Less than six, six months. No, since September. Since September. This should be six months, okay. like, now. Um, you should move tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> right. Let me explain why. Um, if your sand bed is less than six months old, you can just move it and use the sand the way it is. If it's more than six mm-hmm. months old, I say to wash out the sand and put the, the clean sand in the tank in the new location. So that's why I'm like, you have to hurry up and move because you're at the six months mark. Just right before. Well, I'm I think sure it's fine at seven. It but if it's like really 10 low. months, 11 months, you know. Um, the bio load in the yeah. tank is very low. So I don't think it's the same as okay. someone who's put in, you know, 15, 20 fish right. already. So I might be okay in that sense. But yes. 
I might still just yeah. buy a new bag of sand but, okay. and put half So half. you're going to empty the tank. You want to empty the tank out. You want to put all the sand in buckets. Um, you don't have to cover it in water. You can have like, you know, a little water on top if you want. It's a 30 man drive. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's not 30 minutes right. from, you're going to just scoop it out, haul it to a truck, haul everything else. Then you finally go, all of that, there's more time involved than 30 minutes. Yeah. It could be six hours before you finally get to your destination because of all the work you did in advance. So if you want to put a little water to cover the surface of the sand like this much, that's okay. And then clean the tank really well. So when you print the new location, it's ready to go. And then you're going to reverse everything. But like I said, if the sand bed's older than six months, I like to wash it out just to get all the sediment out. So you're starting fresh. And I would just save just a couple of cups of the used yeah. sand. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry about the dog. Yeah. Is it horrible? <laughs> no, you're fine. You're fine. Um, I'm right. lucky Jack, my stop. dog and cat aren't harassing me. Um, uh, yeah, I'm lucky the dog and cat aren't harassing me about something. Uh, look in the chat. Like, so um, so you're going to move your tank. You should have plenty of more salt water available at the new location because if you run out or you lost some during the transport, you want to have more so you can get your tank operational. And if you still don't have enough salt water for some reason, Let's say everything went wrong. If you can just fill the tank three quarters of the way and just get salt water mm -hmm. in there to put the livestock in, you can put a heater in the water. You can add a power head to move circulation and you can start making more water at the new location and finish filling it up the next day. That's totally fine. Yeah. So don't panic. You can't fill it to the brim and have enough to run the sump. It's okay. Your just stuff will be okay ignore overnight the sump as long as you have circulation and, and heat. Put a heater yeah. and a pump and everything in there and you're fine. Yeah. Right. But I think ideally, that's probably if people are moving, what I like to gonna, do. I don't have the. I'm just going to say. <laughs> tubs and everything talk about to you. do. Um, yeah. You're right. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, ideally, what I like to tell people to do is to pay an extra month's rent on the old place and go ahead and move all mm -hmm. your stuff and leave the tank. And that way yeah. you can take your time for a couple more days to just deal with the tank itself and move <sighs> that with friends' help and get the job done mm -hmm. and at the end you're uh it's just easier and all you do is pay some rent you're right all right i'm gonna go close i no you're fine um let me go through the chat while he's doing that so Yeah, she's still barking. I don't know what's going on out there. Maybe I'm getting a delivery. <laughs> I have no do, idea. Oh, this is an interesting question. I do not know. Hold on. How do I? So question, do corals, this must have been in relation to the upside down tank. You know, do corals have a, you know, do they care about gravity um, like terrestrial plants do? Um, or will they grow? I've seen people grow coral underneath rocks like i don't know for sure but i have seen people grow like lower light corals underneath rocks if they have a large blanket of light in the tank um so the reflection off the glass and the sand is enough yeah. so i would assume right. that they would be fine but i don't know if that applies to all um right i don't know i did see one thing and i don't know if it's true that supposedly some fish are really sensitive to where the light is um so mm -hmm. some fish will actually flip if the light was coming from the bottom yeah. so you'd have to be really careful with what fish you i haven't heard that in the tank. um wow. i was i heard it That's somewhere funny. online when i was researching That's a valid it, question. But yeah yeah because they I don't kind know of the gravity question based on, it... yeah I don't know about the gravity question. I mean, that's a great question, actually. You know, we all tend to operate with box of water that's open on the top and there's mm -hmm. a light above it. That's how we all do it. But I do think of the line from Jurassic Park where uh, Jeff Goldblum says, life finds a way. So there are times yeah. where you'll see something grow underneath a rock and you would think, why would it do that? Because mm -hmm. there's no light, there's less flow, but it just keeps encrusting and keeps traveling. And you flip the rock over and it's all covered in life. So I guess certain mm -hmm. types of corals probably don't mind. There are some corals that are non-photosynthetic, which means they don't care about light at all. They didn't want it. They're used to living in total darkness. So you could have things that are living there. As long as there's a food source, they will live under the rock or, or point downward and continue to do quite well. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think, I mean, that actually might be one of your harder parts is that food source with some of the corals yeah. that more readily want to be fed. How do you right. get, because a lot of those corals don't like a lot of flow when they're eating. You're supposed to turn off pumps, but yeah. somehow you have to shoot food upwards. So you'd have to, I think you'd have to do a lot more like SPS and stuff that doesn't rely on food just settling on them as much. You know, they're grabbing little it's particulates. broadcast feeding. You do mm -hmm. broadcast feeding with very fine particle food like reef, uh, like a reef roid or something like that. That food right there, you uh, stir it up and you, you mix it and you pour it in the tank and it's like a cloud. And the SPS polyps mm -hmm. just open up and grab it. They just capture it. You actually don't yeah. stop the flow when you're feeding broadcast feeding. You want to move around the tank. You want the parents to keep pushing mm -hmm. it so that the corals can keep capturing the particulates. So that one yeah. would probably be okay. But if you're trying to like put pellet yeah. food on an upside down coral, that's gonna be challenging because pellets tend to sink, and there's no way to like, right like any of the go up. <laughs> um, like your scallies and stuff like that. Like trying to put bigger, yeah. meatier foods on something like that is kind of what I was thinking. Um, yeah, upside down would be really hard, really hard. Mm -hmm. I can't wait for you to do it. <laughs> uh, it's, I'm gonna figure it out. I don't know when. It's and then happen, as all the but... food settles to the bottom of the tank and covers the light, you're like, dang it. I need to push it up. <laughs> a lot yeah. of cleanup crew. You're going to see a lot of cleanup crew in that tank. Um, you know, um, I joke yeah. about Australia all the time because they're the other side of the planet and they're, mm -hmm. you know, we always joke they're upside down. If anyone's upside got an upside down, down right. reef, it's going to be people in Australia. <laughs> mm -hmm. Hey, technically every single one is, right? So, yep. <laughs> yes. I saw a funny picture the other day. It showed all the boats sailing uh, in uh, where that famous opera theater is uh, that was in Finding Nemo. Why can't I think of the name? Sydney. Anyway, the, yeah, the Sydney the Opera. Was upside down. So there was the Sydney Opera here, and all the sailboats were right here, and there was the sky because it, mm -hmm. it's upside down. <laughs> yeah. They'd flip the image. It's like, how do they make the boats hold on so tight? So, yeah, it's just dumb. <laughs> no, I've seen things like that. Yeah, and you just got to laugh at it it's like um yeah i always struggle to wrap my head around so um uh, like my wife is brazilian and um so some of her mm -hmm. family's in the chat too and like the concept of when it's winter here it's summer there and like i know it i've known yeah. it for years but it yeah. still doesn't seem yeah right you know what i mean like no, it seems awful. It's, it's January. Terrible. It's supposed to be cold. Yeah. You know? right, like, yeah. August is hot. January is cold. Don't flip it on me. Like, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. I'm going to have to figure out how to do an upside down reef, I guess. It's going to be my next project. I can't wait. If I need any custom acrylic work, I'm going to be reaching out to you. <laughs> All right. So you. Speaking of that, so you have pretty much turned this into your job, like coral and yeah. everything is your, so you run a dry goods. You don't do live goods, right? Correct. Yep. Um, and I've been it's running a dry goods online? company now since, yes, and it's been going on since 2009. So Thanks. 14 years? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, Crazy. Can what would you so i see a lot of people say like when you take your hobby and you turn it into a job you mm -hmm. lose some of the it loses some of the fun has that impacted you as much or not really because it's just the dry goods no it hasn't affected me in a negative way probably because i keep telling people i'm still a hobbyist you know it's, yeah. it's a mental thing mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. if you mentally think oh i'm industry i'm this i'm that you know I don't know. It sometimes it comes down to ego and I have very little ego. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah. I believe in myself, but I don't have like this weird ego that dominates the conversation, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And uh, I tend to think of myself as a hobbyist and I've put in a lot of legwork over the years, learning and getting educated and helping others learn, you know, for free. And so at this point, I feel like a lot of customers buy things from me sort of as a thank you or a favor. <laughs> keep me, you know, keep me fed, mm -hmm. keep my fish fed. 
They're like, okay, let me buy something from Mark. It'll help him a little bit, you know? And, uh, and I appreciate that little bit of business. I mean, you know, it's nice to be able to wake up in the morning, make a pot of coffee working without having to go to a place to do it. I, I work here, right. you know? Yeah. I built a studio in the backyard last year and it took almost a year to complete. And I call it the studio. It's a, a, a 20 by 20 building where I do all my acrylic fabrication, where I actually glue the products and where I pack the orders and, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, phot product photography for the website. But uh, the garage is still dedicated to the CNC machine where the materials are cut out. So I still have to walk through the house to work, but um, yeah. I'm not working in my living room like I did for the last decade. I'm now, now my living room is the living room. And on Monday, I'm getting, assuming the weather cooperates, which has been all over the place. I keep watching the weather. See mm -hmm. right now, Monday, no rain. But two days ago, it said 90% chance of rain on Monday. Anyway, Monday, I'm supposed to get all new carpet in the whole house. And this yeah. desk area I'm in right now is going to go away from this living room forever. It's going to go into one of the bedrooms once they have new carpet. And then okay. this living room will be sofa, love seat or sectional coffee table aquariums television that's it nothing so that feels like just business ever again space and yeah yes yeah you after all this from, time uh, yes yeah. and so i do most of the work out there you know in the in the studio mm -hmm. and uh i love that building i it was a thirty-five thousand dollar investment of my own money i just poured from concrete up and it took right. like i said a lot of it i built myself a lot of it was diy <clears throat> you know i hired a company mm -hmm. to pour the concrete I hired a company, put up a metal building, and then I had to put in all the stud work inside there, you know, the two by fours mm -hmm. to put yeah. sheetrock on because the metal building has a leg every 57 inches. That is such a weird number apart. That is a weird and, number. Yeah, that's. And nothing right. lines up with it. Nothing. No. And there's no corners to even screw sheetrock into or the studs into. So I basically had to make four walls that connect with each other within the perimeter of this metal building. And mm -hmm. I did the installation inside, which I hired a company for that one as well. And I hired a company to put in the really nice flooring on the concrete so it, it lasts forever. Yeah. It's sort of like that really tough textured, colorful stuff that they put in garages sometimes. And um, oh, so anyway, okay. I've got I that in there. Right and, and then I made a shop area in the back where I have all the products up on shelves. And people keep saying, I had no idea you sold all this stuff. And I was like, yeah. It's been hiding in my back bedroom forever. And you, you know, you'd walk in there, it's just wall to wall product. And they, like, they mm -hmm. wouldn't even know what they needed because there's just, you couldn't tell. So I created yeah. an entire like wall of product that's 18 feet wide of everything I sell. And now people can say, I need this, I need that, I need this. And I make some money, it's great. So, it, but it, most of the people that buy, buy online, like you said, I just have some mm -hmm. that are local that will show up at my door and they want to see the reef and they want to pick up an order or they want to buy a few more things while they're here. And they've been supporting me and it's nice to be able to run this company. I, I really thought COVID was going to kill my business because I thought everyone's going to be so worried about survival. They're mm -hmm. going to pay for electricity and food and a roof over the head and their hobbies are done. And I say, there goes yeah. Milo's Reef. That's it. No more business for me. <laughs> Who's going to keep an aquarium when you, when it's all about survival in a pandemic, a global pandemic. Which is pandemic, funny because you know? it seemed to be the opposite actually, at least. It was. At least around here, yeah, everything took off with all pets in general. But I mean, even this one, like, because people were just bored at home and looking for something yeah. to do. Plus, I know I mean, it was we weird getting stimulus checks, so it was easy to blow it on fish stuff. Me, right. <laughs> right. blow it on me. Um, I know it was great. Exactly. I had one fantastic you know. year when I was thinking I'm going out of business, and instead I had mm -hmm. orders like never before. And I was like, wow, this is the awesome. The hard part, though. I remember watching one of your um, videos from that time and you made a comment how hard it was to get the supplies you needed specifically yes. for your acrylic business. And you yeah. were like, I ordered these months ago yeah, and I just got them, you know, what, yeah. three months later. Yeah. That was your hard part. Like I've got all these orders. Everyone's trying to get yeah. stuff, but I can't get it to them. I know. And, you know, that's not just my company. Ecotech has, you know, been – a solid company for probably 15 years now, maybe longer, right? And mm -hmm. they still have a hard time keeping up with making Versa pumps because they can't get a certain component. Mm -hmm. And I like that dosing pump a lot. And I've been on back order for a set of four that's on a mounting bracket. It's real pretty looking. It's expensive. I've been on back order for two years. I ordered it two years ago and I'm still waiting to get my set of four mm -hmm. pumps. 
And, you know, anyone well, else who just buys something else. And I'm calling Ecotech, where's my pumps? I still want them. Right. If it makes you feel better um, that it's not just you and it's not just this hobby. So yeah. I come from a food and beverage background. Um, during the pandemic, Anheuser-Busch, mm -hmm. a.k.a. Bud Light, Budweiser, etc., yeah. was buying every single, like, microbrewery they could find mm -hmm. they didn't care what the beer was all mm -hmm. they cared is whether or not they had glass and aluminum stockpile oh. yeah and so they were making a deal with those companies and saying hey listen you are not going to make beer until covid ends but you're going to give us your aluminum and your glass but when covid ends we are going to give you national distribution. Wow. You know, so you pause for now and then you get this yeah, afterwards. Yeah, yeah. But right now we get the supplies we need. And so they were just pretty much yeah. writing this blank check to anyone that had wow. a stockpile of the raw materials because yeah. they just needed to make Bud Light bottles. I mean, <clears throat> bottles so. and cans. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that's interesting. I didn't know about that. I remember mm -hmm. people saying, oh, Mark, you're going to make so much money because you make all those acrylic dividers that everyone's standing behind. No one bought dividers from me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it never even happened. I had I had like three or four people actually seek me out and say specifically, can you get me a quote? And I'd give them a quote and never heard from them again. But uh, everywhere I went, I'd see – I mean, I saw acrylic barriers. I saw people using shower oh, yeah. curtain from Target just stapled mm -hmm. to the ceiling just to hang a plastic barrier between them and the – employees um, yep it, it's been a rough few years that's for sure but yeah. hopefully 2023 will be better but now the economy is so scary that again people are scared to spend money i mean there's just it's just, the punches keep coming yeah you know? and it affects well, actually, everything i think it might be scarier now because like you said now people are afraid to spend money because everyone keeps saying you know it's going to be a recession it's going to be a recession it's going to be it's like well, you've been saying yeah. that for years now, and it hasn't really happened. So we're just gonna play closer. it by ear, I guess. Like it's something's getting gonna closer. happen eventually, but <laughs> I guess we just gotta. Yeah. There's only so long you can keep the hatches battened down forever. You just gotta kind of live and. Yeah. Try to be safe, but see what happens. Yeah, um, I noticed in your chat yeah. you did have one person ask about what's a good starter fish, and I just wanted to oh, say, you know, that. It's kind of hard to say what's a good starter fish because I mean, it's better to have a plan of what fish do you eventually want to have in the tank. Like if you have a wish list of fish, then you can determine which is the most passive, which is the most aggressive of that group. Because you'll want to put in all the friendly ones first and then save the most aggressive one for last because it'll be the one that rules the tank and dominates. Mm -hmm. So if you put an aggressive fish in first, you know, it's just a mean fish. Everything you try to put in the tank after that, it'll go after it and, and scare it to death or kill it. So yeah. we wouldn't want, like you mentioned, the Achilles tang. That's kind of a little bit of a bully, usually. Uh, they're pretty Yeah, tough. that's an end fish. And, that's the last. And that's an end fish, is my point. You mm -hmm. wouldn't want to start with the Achilles. You want to get everything, and then the Achilles is your your your, your gem. Crowning the, jewel, the right. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. So, you mm -hmm. know, what would be good? Usually damsels and clowns are great starter mm -hmm. fish because they can handle so much bad water quality and survive it yeah. but um you know damsels they're they're fine but they can be aggressive as well and they can be such a pain in the butt later that you regret adding them and then there are certain clowns that are good and there are certain clowns that are bad there are some clowns mm -hmm. that are mean and bite mm -hmm. and they'll bite you and you're just in their tank trying yeah. to rearrange something and they're drawing blood so you don't necessarily right. want that type of clownfish. You want to know which kind of clownfish you're getting. So that's kind of where I was saying you need to make a list of what fish you, you like. You know, what's pretty, what mm -hmm. are you in love with? And then you can start saying, okay, I definitely can't get this one. So what are my good choices now? And you can kind of whittle it down, and then you just start deciding where you want to start. But it was a great question to ask that. I just don't have an easy answer yeah. for you. I can't just say, just go buy a Potter's Angel fish. You'll be fine. You know, because you're like, what's that? Right. You got to have well, a list and of your catch you, with stuff like about. that is, I mean, to make that point of like an angelfish, right? You have to yeah. really think about what you want. Or, you know, earlier you said lionfish. Like, right. if you get an angelfish or a lionfish as your first fish, mm -hmm. yeah. you just really restricted everything else you can put in that tank. Yes, exactly. You know, if you put a lionfish, yep. all of a sudden, you know, 
Nemo doesn't go in there because he becomes right. an expensive dinner. Dinner. You know, <laughs> same thing with yeah. like your, you know, angelfish and stuff like that. Well, now all your expensive coral just became yes. a really expensive dinner. So, right. you know, <clears throat> that's what like I made. I pretty much wrote a whole list of everything I want to stock this tank with. Um, and I heard one thing and I actually, what is your opinion on this? The, especially with tangs, whatever the mm -hmm. largest, whatever the, the attitude of the largest dominant fish is, mm -hmm. is somewhat mimicked by the younger, the smaller ones. So mm -hmm. the, what I heard was it actually applied to your tank a lot. Like the blonde nasos are very mm -hmm. calm by tang standards. Yeah. So because yeah, you are. have this massive dominant fish that is also calm, mm -hmm. your other fish would tend to be, you know, more laid back mm -hmm. is what I heard. Now, I don't know. Um, That's but I interesting. Like that um, concept. I guess it's possible. I can tell you, mm -hmm. I mean, I've had this naso for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you one time I came home from a trip to Oklahoma, I went to a trade to a, to a frag swap event. And this one vendor had a bunch of blue chromas. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know how many, there was just like, so it was a swarm of blue chromas. Yeah. And I was like, how much for all of them? And he was like, are you serious? I'm like, yeah. I mean, how much do I want to get them all? And he's, he threw a number at me. I was like, done, I'll buy them all. And you know, he ended up scooping out of the tank and he counted and goes, okay, there was 15. It looked like a hundred. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, 15. So I paid him the money, whatever it cost me. I have no idea. Maybe I paid five bucks each. I don't even know. But I poured them in my tank when I got home. You know, I put them through safety stop like I always do. And I poured them in the tank and Spock turned black. That blonde Nassau tank turned black from front to back, went to a corner and didn't come out for three days. Just stayed there. Like, what is this confetti in my tank? It's everywhere. And yeah. I was just like are you going to be okay? Are you going to eat any food? And she was like, I'm not coming out till those things are gone. And then finally, after three days, she's like, I guess I'm not going anywhere. And she started okay, to swim I guess and I'll come out and eat it, again. Yeah. But she had a whole weird, re I mean, she had a whole personality about it and she yeah. didn't like that. And uh, then of course the, the blue chromos died off one by one, like they do. And her problem was solved. Soon she yeah. didn't have to deal with any confetti in the tank. Within a year, she was fine. Um, yeah, it was a slow thing. It wasn't like they all died in a week. I mean, it was just like the yeah. the thing about no, chromas. They, I don't know how pe I don't know how people do it, but you get like five or seven or nine or eleven or whatever, and then you end up with ten, nine, eight, seven. They just seem to. Mm -hmm. I don't know. They bully it down to one, and then the one goes away too. It's like, why did you not survive? Aren't you the Darwin of them all? You know, you beat all your friends, and then you just well, have no, I wonder, no, no promise at all. I wonder how much of it is. I mean, up until very recently, it seems people didn't consider like Anthea's and Chromis need a lot mm -hmm. of food. The food, you know, and yeah. like I don't know about you, but like I feed my fish, you know, twice a day, mm -hmm. you know. But like those, I've heard, you know, like Anthea's do a lot better, Chromis do a lot better, like four or five feedings a day. Yeah. So I wonder if it's that could that, be some of that food. like the small one is weakest first because they're getting the least food and then they yep. just die off and so that's why they dwindle or yeah if there is some oops i'm messing with lights if there is some you know they actually just hate each other yeah perhaps it could be a lack mm. of food because i i've never really thought you need to feed a lot for a chromis but yeah they're yeah. always in the water column they're dithering so it makes sense i have never Mm. Learn something new today. Thank you very much. It's a you're probably yeah. Right. Well, it was. I know ants seem to be fed uh, a lot. It's true, but I only have a few, and they seem to tolerate my once a day mega meal. But I do put nori in there pretty much. Yeah. I, uh, almost every other day, I put nori in the tank too during the daytime. So there's that, mm -hmm. and then there's my frozen every single night. And you uh, probably yeah. also though get away with the fact that your tank is nine years old. You know, mm -hmm. same thing how you were saying you do so well with like your uh, mandarin, for example yeah there is stuff to eat in your tank you know yeah. you used yeah, live rock something. you've got the copepods you've got yeah. worms you've got every like there is something in your tank to eat yeah. algae my sponge. tank there's not yeah you're right um you know so yeah. whereas they can probably handle it in yours 
you are the outlier here. Most people don't have a nine year tank. Um, yeah, that's what I was saying. You know, you are the hand of God. Yeah. You decide what lives and what dies based on what you do. Exactly. Um, Sorry, I'm just reading a couple comments. You're fine. Yeah, so someone just said, um, well, it's a two part, but essentially, you know, she's like, there's a lot of steps that go into it, um, into the hobby and everything. And then the people that mm -hmm. manage to do it, you know, have a very nice hobby and stuff like that. But I think. You know, some of it is just that people can't handle all of the, I mean, it is more intensive than freshwater to get back to the original, like the maintenance is yeah. more, the, like everything is just extra. You can't ignore it. Um, with a freshwater, you probably, I don't know, I know nothing about freshwater, but I'm going to assume you can kind of ignore it. And uh, with saltwater, we are topping off daily, we are feeding daily, we're testing weekly. We're cleaning the glass probably daily. Um, and then, you know, if you're trying to grow anything specific like coral, you're going to be mm -hmm. using different additives in the tank on a regular basis, whether you are mixing up solutions or pouring in bottles or dripping in drops, but you're doing that on a daily basis and all of this magic happens. And it's, I mean, it's indoor gardening. If you have a yard and you have grass, yeah, you have grass, boom, done. Okay. And then it rains, grass grows. When the sun bakes it, grass dies. So you in, you decide to dig up the yard and put in sprinklers, and you turn on sprinklers. Now you're mm -hmm. making rain, and then the plants don't look right, so you add fertilizer, and then you know you see weeds, so you use weed killer, and you keep throwing it, and then you plant these flowers, and these flowers need a certain soil, and then these flowers need a certain type of fertilizer that's different than the lawn fertilizer, mm -hmm. right. and it's just, and then you're like, well, drip irrigation smarter. And you create this whole ecosystem outside your home with like 19 steps. And we're doing indoor gardening around an aquarium that's yeah. like you said, 40 gallons, 100 gallons, 400 gallons. And we hook up all our gear. I'll tell you, in 2023, I feel like a lot of people are about the gear. And they buy all these components yeah. like, like, like they're collecting, like they're building the ultimate stereo. You know, they have to get mm -hmm. the ultimate speaker, the ultimate tweet, the ultimate boom box. They, they got to get the perfect music, the perfect cables, and they spend a zillion dollars to make this fantastic surround sound so they can watch Star Wars. <laughs> yeah. But well, I've seen. A, but with our reef tanks, people... we buy all this gear, and they they spend the money on the gear, and then they don't even blink at what it costs for the livestock. But when the livestock dies, they blame the gear, and then they say the hobby's too expensive. And you're right back to that circular discussion in the beginning, when really it was the lack of knowledge that they didn't yeah. learn enough before. I mean, buying gear is fine. Listen, I had a guy years ago call me up and he says, Mark, there's this amazing thing. It was made in Germany and you should go to this link right now. So I type in Google, you know, what it was. And I look at him, like, okay, it's a, a nitrate remover. And he was, yeah, it's amazing. I want to get one. What do you think? And I just said to him, what's your nitrate level? And he says, they measure zero. And I said, then why do you need this? And he just stopped and he got really quiet. We're on the phone. And he's like, you just saved me $500. And I started laughing because <laughs> it was gear and it was new mm -hmm. and he wanted it. Didn't even have a well, need for it. It's new and shiny. It's a new and toy. Think, right. And I think hobbyists tend to think I need all these different pieces of gear. And, and really, when things are going wrong with your tank, the first thing I tell everyone to do is unplug all the extra gear and get down to the core. Lights, flow, stability mm -hmm. of temperature. You know, just solve that. And then you can start adding one component at a time and kind of get back to where you were because all that extra gear has distracted you from paying attention to what's happening in the aquarium. Right. Well, and I, I see it a lot. People are setting up a new tank, right? And they immediately day one, they buy everything, like you said. Yeah. And some of it is irrelevant. Like mm -hmm. if you are cycling a tank for the first time, and you plan on doing it like me where you put in you know one or two fish at a time over an extended period of time like why are you buying a skimmer a, a yeah. fleece roller like all like you don't 
there's a couple fish in my i do not need all that filtration right i have right way too much just biological filtration alone yeah you know for the amount of bio load that's in the tank but yeah so why are you just burning out equipment like it's not even that you're just you don't it's equipment only lasts so long right so say it's going to last you two years three years four years well if the first six months of you having it you didn't even need it you just cut an eighth of its life off for no reason like yeah. There's no need to well, buy I mean, 15 radions and, you know, AI right. blades when you have three frags. Yeah, <laughs> yeah like, it's true. No, and I tell real. people, I did a video a while back called the Reef Timeline, and I talk about what mm-hmm. to add at what point over the first 24 months. And like I tell people, don't even start a refugium until like month five. There's literally nothing in the water that's going to keep the plants growing and thriving in the first two or three mm-hmm. months. And the first month you're cycling, I tell people don't even turn on the lights yet for the first four weeks because there's mm-hmm. absolutely no reason to light the tank other than you want to look in there. So if you want to do that, turn them on, look, turn them off, and be done. And right. leave it alone because it's just idling in the background going through a cycle. Otherwise, you're going to grow nuisance algae, and now you got to throw in cleanup crew. Well, the tank's not really stable enough for it, so the cleanup crew kind of lives, kind of dies, which kind of starts another cycle, which then grows more algae. <laughs> And you, it just, yeah. so you're, you're fighting yourself. And like you said, putting the skimmer too soon doesn't benefit either. And that's where the whole phrase, you got to break in a skimmer comes from. It drives me crazy. I cannot believe people keep saying that. I have never, ever taken a skimmer out of the box and put it on a tank and it didn't skim immediately. It does the job. It does not need to break in. So if the yeah, tank's not the... skimming initially, the tank's too young. It doesn't even need one yet. Right. Well, and here's the it's problem a... with that, right? Everybody says, and all you hear is, you know, take your skimmer and you have to take it out and take it apart and clean it. And when you make it as close to brand new as possible, all of a sudden it works 10 times better than it did. So I fail Mm -hmm. to believe that somehow letting it, you know, break in and get dirty made it better. Like, right. Yeah, because I literally just took mine apart, put it through acid for hours. I made it look brand new again. The skimmer seven years old. I hooked it up, right. and within 30 minutes, I saw brown foam at the top. I mean, it's working yeah. perfectly. It didn't need to at break in after day, my super cleaning. It's a glorified airstone. Yeah. Like right. at the end of the day, it's a glorified airstone. Um, yeah. And you know it is more complicated, but like that's all it is. Yeah. You don't have to break it in. Yeah. Right. So there's there's different gears, like you mm-hmm. said. You might be shaving off the life off the gear. Uh, just certain gears just isn't practical yet. So they need to be added at the right mm-hmm. time, which means you don't have to spend the money up front. You can buy the aquarium and the stand and the lights and, you know, the rock yeah. and the sand and, and the salt and the test kits, and that's it. And then mm-hmm. three months from now, you're like, you know what? Now I'm going to hook up a sump. And you could buy the right. sump then and the return pump, and you could pick up a protein mm-hmm. skimmer. And then you run that for a couple of months, and you're like, okay, I'm going to activate the refugium zone. And then you're like, okay, now I'm going to go ahead and get a fleece roller. It, it all should happen. Right incrementally at the right times not all at the beginning and that way it all works in tandem and works in unison and works to the benefit of the reef inside the aquarium Mm -hmm. the the livestock because ultimately it's about the livestock it's not about the gear yeah and that doesn't mean you shouldn't have a plan right you know because you know okay say you follow that timeline you just had well if you don't give yourself space for a sump then all of a sudden you have to break the tank down and redo everything but like yeah you just work with that plan and then you know okay i'm going to put a fleece roller here i'm going to put a skimmer here i'm going to put a refuge in there like and six months a year down the road when you actually need it then spend the right yeah it's easier to hide the friend that just split up he just left the country he went to ireland to get married and it's a big huge trip through europe and they're gonna be gone like i don't know three weeks so mm-hmm. before a week before he's leaving for this trip, he decides to start his tank. <laughs> and so I'm down there. I, I drove down to Houston, and we hooked up all the plumbing. And uh, the ne- and then I left. And then the next day, he called me up and said, there's a drip, of course. And then he solved the drip and you know got everything situated. And then he brought a huge vat of top-off water next to the tank because he's gone three weeks. And uh, he put webcams on each side from Wise where we can just log in and look. Mm-hmm. Um, I had already pre-programmed all of his Apex gear, so that way he could just go ahead and plug things into the correct outlets. And he kept it super simple. No lights on the tank. He put a lid on top of the tank. He actually put sheets of 
I think polycarbonate or, or sign material to avoid evaporation um, because it's mm -hmm. just rock and sand going down the drain to the stump. There's, yeah. I don't even think he kept filter socks in there. I think because and he's not running the skimmer either. He's letting the water circulate yeah. for three weeks just to let it do its cycle while he's off getting married and honeymooning and seeing Switzerland. And I thought that's a great idea. And so I was just checking on his tank today. Temperature's stable. The water's yep. clear. I looked at the cameras pointed into a sump. I could see the water level there. I could check on the uh, top off container. It was kind of neat, you know, to have all that kind of gear and know what's going on. But he chose to do this while he's gone. So when he gets home, he can then possibly introduce his first fish. You know, he can activate his skylights and, uh, you know, do all the things mm -hmm. and start getting frags from me or something. How do you feel about traveling now that you have a big expensive tank that's a lot to lose if something happens while you're away? Does it, Well, I'm, are you a little I'm, more paranoid I'm, than? Not really. I mean, I'm here all the time and things go wrong. So they're going to go wrong and I'm gone too. It's just a rule. Sure. Like you're about to walk out the door. Something's going wrong right now. You fix mm -hmm. that one thing and you walk out the door and you set the alarm and you lock the door and you get in your car and you're like, here we go. But I always have a tank sitter and they just have to come by once a day and put food in the tank and just kind of let me know if there's anything weird. And mm -hmm. I mean, I remember one time I got a phone call, no, a text from my tank sitter saying, yeah, your calcium reactor wasn't work working right. So I took it apart and fixed it. And I was just like, um, you don't even own a calcium reactor. How would you even know what to do? And it's like, yeah, it's all fixed. I mean, he's super mechanically inclined. He's very smart. Okay. And somehow he solved what was wrong, which was a miracle. I mean, anyone else, I've yeah. had other people that knew the hobby that did, that left me in a horrible situation mm -hmm. instead of solving what was wrong at the time. And I came home and literally put my luggage down by the front door and went into the fish room and fixed the problem for two hours. And then I went and got my luggage and went to, Throw yeah. the laundry in the hamper and you know, start taking a shower. Immediately run to the, yeah. Ignore yeah. everything else. It was run that to the bad. Tank, check it. Oof. It was that bad. But my tanks are super good. I do have the cameras. I do have the apex to let me know what's going on. So mm -hmm. I have some clues. And of course, I just walk in. And usually, I like to walk and just look at all the coral. And hope nothing's white. You know, if any corals turn white, that means something bad happened while it's gone, you know. Right. And, you know, I go to Macna, which is like a five-day trip. And I come back mm -hmm. and one white, one white, one, one white, one, everything else is fine. I'm like, all right, cost of doing business, cost of leaving town. But that hasn't been a thing. I mean, the last year and a half, I've done several trips and I came home and everything was just as healthy as when I left, which is really nice. And um, you do need a, a little bit of luck also. I mean, there's a lot going against you. And so any little bit of luck is always a huge benefit. Yeah. Uh well, I guess I'll, oh, it's been, yeah, we're going on almost two hours. Um, I will, I guess, let you go. If you, did you have anything else you wanted to mention? Um, Buy things from Milo's Reef. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, that's what I, I don't really. I mean, I was don't say, think the hobby's too hard. Here, this is what I'll say. Um, I tell people, if you want to set up a saltwater tank and use the right gear, then usually you need about one hour a week to work on it. Now that doesn't include like putting in food each day, which takes five or 10 minutes, you know, yeah. to melt some food and then pour it in the tank, right? But if you could spend an hour once a week on the aquarium, just to kind of like clean it, it'll look nice. And I prefer to keep an aquarium looking as clean as possible because whenever it's clean, you can see the problems. When it's dirty, mm -hmm. you don't see the flaws. You don't see that the steam of the aquarium is letting go. You don't see that such and such is leaking. You don't see, you know, that this thing's going to short out because there's a, a gap in the wire, you know what I mean? But everything's clean, right. you can spot things immediately. Mm -hmm. And so testing your water every week, which takes about 20 minutes, and then cleaning your glass and maybe, you know, vacuuming something out of the sump, that's your hour. And if you can spend an hour or two on your aquarium once a week, I don't think this hobby's too hard. But if you feel like you're going to spend eight to 10 hours a day on it, yeah, that's a whole other thing. And that's usually someone super OCD and over the top and making their lives too difficult. And you're I know people probably like messing that. up things more than you're like, you're probably oh, yeah. screwing things up, spending that much time tinkering. Like you're I'm actually to helping a client who lives in a different state and he has two tanks at the office and he has one at home. And now that he is only totally messing with the office tanks all the time, his home tank is doing great. 
And he told me today, mm -hmm. he says, you know, I haven't done anything with that tank and everything's doing great in there. And I haven't had any fish die or anything. And I was like, it's because you're, you're keeping your hands out of it. If you could do the right. same thing at the office, you could have some good stuff at the office too. But he's constantly finding something that needs to be done. I'm like, oh no, you don't need to be doing it. So I'm, I'm working with him. Be. I'm trying it's to help happy. him. Yeah. yeah, I'm trying to help him. Yeah. But yeah, I think that's hopefully, you know, people keep getting into the hobby. Hopefully the weird economy doesn't mess with things and it keeps growing. It's a, I'm going to say it and irritate everyone who likes freshwater fish, but it's, it's the better hobby. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I love it. Uh, I know <laughs> I triggered great. a bunch of people, but you know, we'll start a, um, we'll start a storm. Um, no, but I mean, it's that good. So like, it's, it gives you a lot of, options like there's a million things you can do with it and like you said it keeps growing yeah. it gives you something to work on it's like you know a car or something where you can well, keep tinkering a little bit here and there so yeah there's, so. there's always an accessory you can put on a car there's always some new livestock mm -hmm. you've never seen before it could even be right. you want to set up another thing just for that one thing because it's so neat and you're like i really want it but it's not compatible with this livestock. but it's not so reef safe so yeah mm -hmm. right yeah well, that's the and dream. So, yeah, you, you get can, one. And that's, then... that's the nice part, having multiple tanks. And then you yeah, get multiple exactly. tank syndrome. And mm -hmm. then you got to work four, four hours a weekend instead of mm -hmm. two hours a weekend or one hour. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, but once you've done that and you have 15 tanks, like you're too far invested in for four hours a week to really mess with you. So, like, you, yeah. you know, technically you spend most of your week working on fish tank related stuff, but, you know, it's you chose to do that as a job. Like it's, you don't get yeah. to complain about it. <laughs> so, well, I mean, you, you know, know, if I ran a fish store a and I was trying to sell point. livestock, mm -hmm. yeah, it is. But if I had a fish store and I was trying to sell livestock, I'd have to clean 20 or 30 tanks a day. Yeah. I mean, literally you have to clean every mm -hmm. tank because people want to see the livestock to buy it. Mm -hmm. And if you have drips running down the front and you don't have the prices oh, on the it. front and you don't have the tank mm -hmm. clean, or if something died, you didn't remove it because that scares them away. I mean, there's mm -hmm. all that. That's why I don't mm -hmm. want to do livestock. I don't want to deal with all that. So I have one reef. I have a little cute anemone tank. I have another little tank along mm -hmm. with Kaylin that's got her preferred fish in there. And that's my life. And it's not horribly difficult. And I can go outside and go to work out there. My commute across the lawn, it's like 25 feet. It's horrible. Right. And then, you know, I, I come back in and I can just enjoy my reef, watch a movie, have dinner, live my life. It's nice. But yeah. uh, it should not be something that just takes over your life and makes your your life should not be more difficult. You should be benefiting from it. And ho the hobby should be relaxing if you did it right. Mm -hmm. If you're constantly stressed all the time, you're not doing something right. You're doing you something gotta figure wrong. out what you're doing. Yeah, and you got to figure out what it is and stop doing that thing because you should be able to enjoy your tank and enjoy the livestock and enjoy the creatures and, yeah. and enjoy the beauty that you've got in your home. Yeah. I like this comment because that kind of touches on what you've said the whole time. Like, the majority of the time spent should be like figuring out what you're doing, you know, learning yeah. about it, you know, more than anything. And so, yeah. Well, thank you very much for joining me. Uh, sorry about yeah. the mix up with the. Yeah, time zones. That was my fault. That was totally my <laughs> no, fault. So good. I, uh, I'm bad at time zones. I literally thought it was later for me. If your time was six. Yeah. I was like, okay, that makes seven my time. And, and I was right. realizing it's like, oh, no, it's an that hour difference. Five is time. Yeah. I'm messing up. I'm late. And I was like, oh, I'm always late. <laughs> I'm always late. <laughs> well, I got a kick out of that too because I wanted. I almost thought, made a joke out of it because you're always saying when you come on your own streams, you're like, yeah, I'm usually like eight minutes late. You know, I was like, I am. <laughs> got to keep it. That's consistent, why my stream starts you know? at two oh eight because I'll never be there at two, and I'm struggling mm -hmm. to get two oh eight. I'm looking at 208 and I'm still trying to get a microphone adjuster to get the light set up right or yeah. hook up the Ethernet cable. And I'm like, oh, it's 209. I got to hit why, start. That's why and you like, play your intro. You play your intro so you have that couple extra seconds to really sit down. I totally need to be better about that intro. But, <laughs> well, I saw you stopped using your, it because you're like, show. it doesn't even match your you know setup anymore. So, No, I got to do a whole new intro. Right. Plus the tank but, looks different now. It looks better. So it's yeah, time. that's true. So yeah. everybody, thank you for watching. Check out Me Loves Reef. He's got his link there. Um, I tagged him in the post. So, you know, check out his thank channel. You. He has a ton of stuff on there. I've been watching his videos for a long time now and still find a million more that I've yet to watch. Um, 
So there's a you know, really there's a good, good group for there. someone that wants to, if someone wants to know about what it's like to day to day take care of a tank, I started a series a year and a half ago called Reef Diary. And I did mm -hmm. like 140 episodes in a row. Mm. I did like 121 days in a row or something. And then I stopped because I got injured. But yeah. um, you could see what I did every single day. And some days I did nothing. And other days I worked on this, or I worked on that, or I cleaned this, or I, mm -hmm. I tested that, or I pictures that day. And that's kind of a fun one because each video is like two to four minutes long. It's not mm -hmm. horribly long. You can kind of binge it. You'll it's probably like ten hours of total watch time. <laughs> right. But you could kind of see but what it's like through several months for... of taking care of the aquarium. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm done that's talking. Actually, do your outro. I gotta <laughs> do you have that as a specific playlist? Is it yeah, a I do. set playlist? Yep. Reef I've diary. seen a bunch of them, but I kind of want to watch it yeah. in order. Like I want to just binge yeah. it in order. So that would be cool. Yeah, you can do that um, with the playlist. I built the whole list. And yeah. what I'm doing now, mm -hmm. I'm doing occasional reef diaries and I just keep adding them to the end of the list. But there's big time gaps between them. You just don't, you know, as a viewer, it's just number 145. But, uh, yeah. you know, you you don't know it's been three weeks between, because I don't make a point mm -hmm. of pointing that out. I just say this yeah. is what I did today. Yeah. But again, everyone, thank you for watching. Subscribe to his channel. Buy stuff from him. Um, you know, a lot of acrylic work, a lot of dry goods. Subscribe to my yeah. channel. Hit a like on the video if you can. And, you know, thank you for watching, everybody. Mark, you have a great night. And All right, you too. What is it? Thanks so much. Almost 8 o'clock. So enjoy the rest of your night. And Yeah, it was nice talking to you. Okay, bye.